Let me uh, take a moment for the introduction. My name is Artem Moganov. I am a professor here at Skoltech, and I will chair today's jury. And uh, here are some uh, facts about each member of the jury. The other members are, uh, next slide please, uh, Professor Blatov from Samara. Um, here you can see some facts about him, but he is extremely well known on the worldwide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, next, please. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Gus Hart, who is also extremely well known in the field throughout the world. Uh, next, please. Max Hodap, next, please. Uh, our own Sergei Levchenko, uh, professor here at Skoltech. Uh, and uh, and uh, next, please. And the supervisor of today's defendant is uh, Skoltech's uh, own professor, Alexander Shapeyev, also an extremely well known world leader, really, in this field. Okay, I think that's all. Yes. And here is the defendant himself, uh, Vadim Satskov hopefully to become Dr. Sotskov in a few brief moments. Uh, here you see some facts about him. And after this brief introduction, we are ready for his talk. 40 minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. I would like to thank personally all the PGD jury members, Artyom Morganov, uh, Sergei Levchenko, Gus Hart, Vladislav Vladov, and Max Hodov for being with me online. It's a pleasure for me to have you in my PhD jury. Today I'm defending my PhD thesis called Data-Driven Design of Multi-Component Alloys. It was completed under supervision of Professor Alexander Shapeyev and is defended within a doctoral program in material science and engineering at Skoltech. Uh, availability of new materials is the main driving factor for technological development. And one uh, class of materials gaining serious attention right now are metallic alloys. They have plenty of applications, as you can see from this slide, ranging from nuclear fusion reactors, shells, to coins, coatings, and biomedicines. And in all of these applications, materials should possess excellent mechanical stability, phase stability under radiation and high temperature, and corrosion resistance, as well as other valuable properties. Uh, the conventional method for alloy synthesis consists in mixing uh, one, two, or at most three principal components with a small amount of alloy additions. Such approach introduces the so-called conventional alloys and almost all possible uh, materials that could be synthesized by this conventional method has been already discovered and they have some sort of practical implications and for that reasons there are still a lot of technological areas where these materials can't meet operational requirements. So we obviously need new alloys with uh, superior mechanical and uh, phase stability properties. And recently a new alloying technique has emerged. It consists in mixing multiple components in nearly equal proportions and usually we mix more than five components. In such approach introduced the conceptually new class of alloys known as compositionally complex alloys, multi-principal element alloys or high entropy alloys. And through my, throughout my presentation I will call them as high entropy alloys. What's interesting in chemistry of these materials? Well first of all when we mix uh, multiple components together we sufficiently increase the enthalpy, the uh, mixing entropy and at some point it overweighs the enthalpy of formation and by that we obtain a solid solution phase within these materials. I will not go in deeply into details right now about physical properties of a solid solution by, but a solid solution is that very phase that possesses uh, the valuable mechanical properties that we are looking for. So it is of high interest for us to discover as much of these materials as we can. Uh, however, there is a certain problem with experimental discovery of such materials. If we try to 
to synthesize a multi-component alloy using all possible metallic elements from the periodic table, we will encounter a combinatorial explosion in the number of uh, elemental combinations. Even if we restrict ourselves to synthesize five component equimolar alloy from relatively commercially available elements that are also non-toxic, we still will end up with more than one million possible materials that we need to assess. And considering trial and error character of experimental approach, we uh, can't afford ourselves a high throughput design of such materials. So obviously we need a clever assistance in materials design. And this clever assistance can be provided by computational materials design. And first of all, <clears throat> what we need to answer is to whether this material is stable at a certain conditions. Well, first of all, we can answer, we can investigate the stability of uh, a ground state phase or at zero Kelvin. This task is also known crystal structure prediction because presumably we uh, discover ordered structures at this case. And also modeling of phase stability at finite temperature to investigate all the disordered transitions, which are highly available in investigation of high entropy alloys. Uh, considering these two tasks, they uh, stem on two pillars. First, the structure generation method, which provides uh, the geometry of a structure along the optimization direction. And second is the interatomic interaction model that calculates the energy of the structure. However, considering crystal structure prediction and modeling phase stability, there are problems with both of these two. In case of crystal structure prediction, we would have to scan enormously huge uh, configurational space of all possible geometries uh, during the optimization. And if we'll try to do it uh, in a brute force fashion, it would be an NP hard problem. Of course, there are great algorithms exist that can partially solve this problem, but usually they face some problems when we increase the number of constituted chemical elements more than five, for example. And in case of modeling phase stability at finite temperatures, the diffusion processes in high entropy alloys are quite slow due to difference in atomic sizes and lattice distortions. So it will be also problematic to study all the disordered transitions using molecular dynamics. And in case of interatomic interaction model, the computational complexity of DFT do not allow us to uh, design these materials in a high throughput fashion, obviously. So, ob so reasonably, we still need the new efficient computational methods for the design of such materials. And in my thesis, I aim to develop such methods. And the solution which I propose is to use on lattice modeling or in, in on lattice modeling, the concept consists in using the fixed lattice, or simply speaking, we already know the geometry of the material of the material that we're looking for, of its crystal structure. So instead of optimizing the geometry during the structure search, we optimize the occupancy of the way how items occupy the sides of the fixed lattice. Also, you can call this as uh, structure decorations. Uh, this allowed to reduce the size of the configurational space which you have to scan and redistribute the computational resources towards the discovery of multi-component systems. And to enhance the efficiency of my methods even more, I use on latest data-driven potentials, so simply machine learning to atomic potentials to evaluate the energy of the structures. And by that, I substitute the cubic complexity of DFT with the linear complexity of machine learning potentials. Uh, so in my <clears throat> thesis, I, I developed this methodology for both tasks, crystal structure prediction and modeling phase stability at finite temperatures. For crystal structure prediction or CSP, I uh, developed a new structure generation algorithm, which I called on lattice CSP and combined it with uh, models like low rank potential and cluster expansion. And for modeling phase stability at finite temperatures, I used the well-established uh, canonical on lattice Monte Carlo, but in my work, I also show that it is possible to apply this methodology to materials with different chemistries, such as high entropy carbides. And I combined this method with the low rank potential. <clears throat> this is the outline of my work. I start with presenting the methodology, including the interatomic interaction models and the developed structure generation algorithms. Then I show you the results. Three works were done during my uh, PhD studies and the conclusions will be made afterwards. Uh, all the interatomic interaction models that I use in my work have one thing in common is that they are local. It means that they are trained to 
uh, calculate the energy of an atomic neighborhood. The energy of an atomic neighborhood, or the atomic neighborhood is the collection of atoms around the central atom within a specified cutoff radius. Uh, so in order to calculate the total energy of configuration, uh, we just simply sum up the energies of all the neighborhoods present inside the structures. Uh, in computer memory, uh, this uh, model also can be viewed as, ten as multidimensional tensors where each element of the tensor corresponds to the energy of a certain neighborhood. And the indices of the tensors are simply the relative atomic numbers of atoms that are present in the corresponding neighborhood. The first model that I used is called low rank potential or LRP for short. Uh, and in LRP, the energy of atomic neighborhood is represented in the tensor train format. <clears throat> which is simply, uh, which simply reminds of uh, matrix decomposition, but generalized for multidimensional tensors in a SVD-like fashion. Uh, and uh, the parameters of these matrices and vectors of and uh, vectors from the multiplication are obtained by solving the following minimization pro by solving the following minimization problem, where we minimize the uh, mean squared error between the energies predicted by potential and the DFT energy. Uh, the tensor, represent tensor train representation itself originates from the tensor train decomposition, and since, since decomposition has its own rank, a low rank potential has its own rank as well. Uh, and the higher the rank, uh, the higher will be the number of parameters, and hence uh, the higher the precision of the used potential. Uh, the next model is the cluster expansion, uh, where the energy of an atomic neighborhood is expanded uh, as a linear combination of a basis functions, which are simply the atomic occupations on the lattice sites. And the coefficients of these basis functions that are also called efficient cluster interactions are again fitted by solving the same minimization problem. In my work, I use three types of clusters, pairs of uh, nearest neighbors, second nearest neighbors, and triple cluster, where these two atoms are nearest neighbors of the central atom. Uh, now I'm coming to the description of uh, developed structure generation algorithms, and I start with a description of an algorithm developed for CSP problem. The algorithm is called Tonlet to CSP. If we consider on the modern CSP methods, almost all of them have one thing in common is that they operate with initially complete structures that have periodicity. And by applying some geometry transformations in evolutionary fashion or simple geometrical relaxations, we obtain the discovered structure. On lattice CSP is conceptually different. We, instead of operating with initially complete structure, we build the structure from scratch by ordering atom by atom, as you can see on the slide, and eventually obtain the discovered structure. In such sense, this process can be also imagined as the structure growth. So let's investigate this pro process in more details. I'll give you an example for the binary alloy and for the simplicity, all the illustrations will be two-dimensional. We start with an empty configuration where we choose an empty site. Then we sequentially fill the site with all types of items used in the simulations, uh, used in our simulation and produce uh, the candidate configurations. In case of a binary alloy, there will be two candidate configurations. We calculate the energies and choose uh, the one with the lowest energy to produce the next population. And so in this case, this algorithm uh, can also be understood as an evolutionary. Uh, next, we choose the nearest neighbor inside. Again, fill it in all possible ways with atoms, create uh, candidate configurations, calculate the energy and choose the one with the lowest energy. We proceed further in the same way until we end up with a larger structure with a more number of atoms. Each time an atom is ordered to a growing configuration, the algorithm tries to detect identical neighborhoods. Two neighborhoods are identical if they uh, have atoms with the same atomic numbers relative to the central atom. Here you can see two identical neighborhoods, and once they are discovered, the centers are connected with the vector. And this vector will be the first vector of the unit cell of the future structure. Once uh, the vector is constructed, the growth area is reshaped uh, by uh, inserting the coordinates of this vector into the supercell matrix of the growth area using Maxwell algorithm. 
once the growth area is reshaped, we have to translate items that appear to be on site of this new area back. And there might be cases where two items of two different atomic types share the same site after translation, as you can see here. In order to resolve this conflict, we create all possible alternative configurations in which this site is filled in all possible ways by atomic types, calculate the energies of such configurations, and choose the one with the lowest energy. Uh, then the growth is continued within the new area. We perform all the same steps to construct the second and the third lattice vector and finally obtain the discovered structure. Uh, during the structure growth, uh, all the atoms are having incomplete atomic neighborhoods. And these atoms create the, a substantially large surface area, which eventually increase the uncertainty in energy. Algor algorithm simply doesn't know which atom to put here in order to obtain a lower energy structure. And eventually, the larger uh, surface area can increase the energy, and the algorithm might adopt a suboptimal structure generation trajectory. In order to minimize this effect, I apply the strategy which I call alchemical interaction. It's quite simple. I calculate the energies of such neighborhood as an average of all possible neighborhoods that can be produced instead of this incomplete one. Here you can see how I insert uh, items in all possible ways uh, in, the, in these empty sites. And then I calculate uh, the energy of such neighborhood as the mean of the energies of that alternative of neighborhoods and eventually it helps algorithm to choose a more optimal structure generation trajectory. Uh, and the final hint of the algorithm is bias in the potential. If we run on lattices P with the same trained model, it will predict the same structure over and over again because we do not change any parameters in uh, our trained model and the algorithm strictly follows what a potential tells him to do. In order to force algorithm to predict new structures, I bias the potential after each prediction. In order to do so, I owe the constant value delta to energies of the neighborhoods that are present in the discovered structures, and, they, and then I up, update the potential with the new energies of the neighborhoods. So next time, the previously discovered structure will be high in energy, and the algorithm will adopt another structure generation trajectory, hoping to discover a lower energy structure this time. For modeling phase stability at finite temperatures, I used the largest canonical Monte Carlo. It starts with a random structure, randomly chooses two adjacent sites and interchange types of items of these sites. Then we calculate the energy of the new and the previous state. And if the energy of the new state is lower, we accept it for the next Monte Carlo step. Otherwise, we calculate the, probability, the ratio of probabilities of the system being in the new and the previous state generate a random number and if this random number is lower than the ratio of probabilities we accept the new state otherwise reject it. Mm -hmm. Now I come to a presentation of the results which I obtained during my PhD uh, and first I start with presenting the results I obtained from Lattice TSP. This work was recently published in Journal of Materials Research and in this work I aim to discover a new stable alloys in Niobium molybdenum tantalum tungsten system using on lattice CSP. Alloys within this system has BCC lattice. According to a flow, there are 26 stable binaries, nine stable ternaries, but no quaternaries are reported. The only rep uh, a uh, reported quaternary was recently discovered by Michael Wiedem as the decomposition of uh, equimolar niobium molybdenum tantalum tungsten into BCC niobium and BCC niobium molybdenum 2 tantalum 2 tungsten 2. So in this work, I uh, aim to discover new compositions, including quaternaries, and can compare my results with the airflow database. In this work, I developed on lattice CSP code, performed uh, the simulations, analyzed the results, and prepared the manuscript. Here you can see the simulation procedure that I used. I start with the initial training set, calculate the DFT convex hull with the structures that I already have in the initial training set. Then I train CEOLRP potential, perform on lattice CSP simulations, build on lattice CSP convex hull, and select the structures that align within five mill electron volt per atom gap above the convex hull. Then I relax the structures with DFT and update the training set. And after that, I recalculate uh, the updated training set with DFT to build the convex hull. 
in order to check whether there are any new structures lying on the convex hull. If the convex hull keeps updating, I continue this loop simply because it means that the algorithm still continues to uh, predict new structures. If at some point DFT convex hull stops updating, I finish the simulation just because it means that algorithm can't predict any new structures. Uh, a few words about DFT relaxation. To start the relaxation, I approximated lattice parameter as the mean of lattice parameters of unary compounds uh, that uh, the mixture contains. And since the algorithm generates structures with different cell shapes and sizes, I use automatic K-mesh generation by setting a spacing value to 0 0.13. Uh, First, I started with validating my algorithm on niobium tungsten binary system. I used cluster expansion, and a flow contains three stable binaries, niobium tungsten with P32 structure, niobium tungsten 3, and niobium tungsten 7. The initial training set contained pure niobium, pure tungsten, and equimolar, and equimolar niobium tungsten B2, just be, not B32, because I wanted to perform fair tests. The final training set contained 117 configurations uh, with a 5.1 milliliter volts per atom root mean square error. Uh, here you can see the final convex hull produced by the algorithm and uh, re-estimated with density functional theory. As you can see, the algorithm was able not only to discover all the stable binaries from a flow, and actually one of the stable binaries in a flow became unstable. It was also able to discover six new uh, stable binaries. And as you can see, <clears throat> the structures with the lower position below the airflow convex hull were absorbed near the center of the phase diagram, which means that additions of tungsten contrib contribute to high phase stability of uh, this binary system. Next, I validated the algorithm on tenary molybdenum tantalum tungsten. I used cluster expansion as interaction model. A flow contains four stable ternaries. The initial training set in a similar way contained only pure elements and their cumulative mixture. Final training set contained 109 configurations with a rhythmic square error of eight milliton volts per atom. Here you can see the final convex hull estimated with the DFT, three new uh, binary, three uh, new ternaries as well as three new binaries were discovered. Uh, and after I discovered three new ternaries, I observed an interesting trend that when the concentration of uh, tungsten increases in uh, molybdenum tantalum alloy, the formation enthalpy also increases. It means, it probably means that uh, phases with the highest stability can be observed near molybdenum tantalum region of a phase diagram. Also, some of the structures like molybdenum tantalum tungsten 5 are marked as lying within a gap less than one milliliter volt per atom above convex hull. I decided to consider them as stable also because as I told you, I used automatic case uh, K-mesh generation, which can introduce the noise into calculation of energy. So this phase might be stable or might be not with some precision. Uh, finally, <clears throat> I validated algorithm on four component new molybdenum tantalum tungsten system. I used low rank potential this time. Only one quaternary is reported in literature. In a similar manner, the training set contained five structures, pure elements, and the equimolar mixture. The final training set contained 380 configurations with a root mean square error of 7 milliliter volts per atom. Here you can see the final four component convex hull. Unfortunately, the algorithm was not able to detect the structure from the literature, but it discovered two new four component structures, niobium molybdenum tantalum tungsten 6, and the interesting example, niobium molybdenum to tantalum tungsten 18, and has 22 atoms uh, in a unit cell, which manifests that the algorithm is able to discover multi component structures for the relatively large unit cells. Uh, so, by using on lattice CSP, I have uh, discovered 14 new structures that were not reported in the AFLO database. And what's more important, only a few hundred DFT calculations were required to obtain the result in all of the cases, which suggests that the algorithm is a good step towards the high throughput design of materials. Next, I investigated phase stability of hafnium tantalum titanium niobium zirconium high entropy carbide using 
on Lattice Monte Carlo and low rank potential. This carbide uh, represents the family of uh, refractory high entropy ceramics. They uh, have high stability uh, at high temperatures, which means that they can be used in high temperature applications, for example, in jet engines. Uh, this carbide has FCC lattice, and the common method of synthesis of this material is, the, is to use arc plasma sintering. However, uh, the temperature of formation of a solid solution is not specified. And as I told you at the beginning of uh, my presentation, what we are looking for in high entropy alloys is the solid solution phase. So the synthesis of this material is not straightforward because experimentalists simply don't know how to adjust the parameters of their machinery in order to obtain the right phase and to produce the right temperature that we are looking for because they simply don't know the temperature. So in my research, I aim to determine the temperature formation of a solid solution, study uh, the regions of its phase stability by using Monte Carlo simulations with LRP. In this work, I developed on lattice CMC code, performed the computational experiment, analyzed the results, and prepared the part of the manuscript where theoretical results are reported. The experimental part of the work uh, was performed by my collaborators from Tomsk Polytechnic University. Uh, here's uh, the simulation procedure. I started with the initial training set, trained LRP, performed Monte Carlo simulations within the temperature range, and uh, plotted heat capacity. If I observe some anomalies on the heat capacity plot, like abrupt sharp peaks, I sample structures within the corresponding temperature regions, relax them with DFT, update the training set, and perform the loop again until I obtain a good heat capacity plot. Uh, the initial training size training set was contained 115 configurations. The final size was 350 configurations with a root mean square error on a validation set of nine point of nine milliliter volts per atom. A few more words should few more words should be said about the simulation details. First, I during Monte Carlo I excluded carbon atoms from the unit cell from the supercell, so the supercell was purely metallic. It was done because it was observed that uh, the probability of uh, carbon atoms to diffuse throughout the supercell is negligible in comparison with the probability of metallic atoms to diffuse throughout the, the supercell. The simulation supercell contained nearly 7,000 atoms. The temperature range was between 500 to 2,000 Kelvin with a 100 Kelvin step. And I performed 1 million Monte Carlo steps at each temperature. Uh, for the DFT relaxation, I extracted 32 atoms subsample from a supercell and inserted back eight atoms, carbon atoms on their position. So in this simulation, uh, the carbon atoms are <clears throat> implicitly account. Uh, we account for carbon atoms implicitly. Uh, here you can see the specific heat capacity plot, and as you can observe, the phase transition occurs at nearly 1,200 Kelvin. And next, I analyze the phases uh, below and above the phase transition temperature. At first, I analyze the phase observed above the phase transition temperature. Here you can see sample at 2,000 Kelvin. And according to uniform distribution of metallic elements along the supercell, which is also confirmed by the concentration distribution plot of each species around, uh, along supercell vector B, we can judge that this is the solid solution phase that we were looking for with calculated lattice parameter of 4.51 angstrom. So the answer is that solid solution phase forms at temperatures above 1,200 Kelvin. And uh, up to this temperature, it is stable. Next, the theoretical and uh, experimental XRD diagrams were compared and the full correspondence between diffraction angles and peaks were observed and also full correspondence between calculated and experimental lattice parameters were observed as well. As you can see, the calculated lattice parameter is 4.51 angstrom and experimental is 4.49 with a measurement error of 0 0.03 angstrom. At temperatures below phase transition, namely at 500 Kelvin, the phase decomposition into two phases were observed. First of all, you can see that titanium carbide do not mix with zirconium and hafnium carbide, but perfectly mixes with niobium and tantalum carbides, which means that one of the emerged phases is titanium niobium tantalum carbide. This is also evident from 
the concentration distribution plot. As you can see, while the concentration of titanium increases throughout the super selector B, the concentration of zirconium and hafnium decreases rapidly. However, the composition uh, of the second phase is under the question because here we can see the perfect mixing be be between zirconium, hafnium, and tantalum, but whether these three carbides mix with niobium carbides, we can't <coughs> be sure just from this picture. Uh, so the, experiment, the theoretical XRD was plotted for all the possible second phase. Uh, here we can see that uh, solid solution one and solid solution two has a, a good correspondence between the peaks and their diffraction angles. And also we observed a uh, good correspondence between uh, calculated lattice parameters for both phases. In order to shed the light on the phase composition of the second phase, the stability was analyzed by calculating Helmholtz free energy uh, of competing carbides that might occur. And, if you, and as you can see, two carbides that correspond to lattice parameters observed experimentally and theoretically are titanium nobel tantalum, which is the first phase, and the second is sarconium hafnium tantalum carbide. So therefore, we can conclude that the second phase has the composition of sarconium hafnium tantalum carbide. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so in this work, I observed that the solid solution phase forms at temperatures above 1200 Kelvin, and the temperatures above this, it is stable. At temperatures below the phase transition temperature, uh, the sample decomposes into titanium niobium tantalum carbide and sarconium hafnium tantalum carbide, and both these phases are actually solid solutions as well. And what's more important, theoretically absorbed phases and corresponding temperatures were confirmed experimentally, which uh, says a lot about uh, uh, the practical importance of the developed approach. Finally, the uh, on lattice Monte Carlo and LRP was applied to investigate phase stability and short range order of uh, medium entropy uh, chromium cobalt nickel alloy. <clears throat> this alloy has FCC lattice. It is known for <clears throat> being a possible material for nuclear reactor shells. And though uh, the entropy also dominates in the formation of these materials, and therefore their phase should be ideally random still, uh, short range order exists to some extent. And it is believed according to different experimental theoretical studies that short range order should possibly impact the mechanical properties of this material. However, in order to make a conclusion uh, how exactly short range order impact the mechanical properties, we need to characterize the nature of short range order, namely what atoms are bonding together in the first coordination shell. If you look at the literature, different literature sources predict different uh, short range ordered states and therefore different uh, energy differences between the purely random structure and the short range ordered structure. So in this work, the aim was to investigate the short range order, study its phase stability, and also answer the question where the magnetism contributes to the ordering behavior and simply adapts to the chemical ordering. In this work, I developed on Lattice Monte Carlo code with which all the simulations were performed. Uh, the simulation procedure is exactly the same as in the previous work with the one minor difference that this time the ensemble of 10 low rank potentials uh, was used and the results are the average of these 10 LRPs. The final training set size was nearly 1200 configurations with a root mean square error of 2.4 milliton volts per atom. Uh, during Mon Monte Carlo simulations were performed on 7,000 atoms tuper cell within a temperature range between 100 to 1,000 Kelvin with 100 Kelvin step with 1 million Monte Carlo steps at each temperature. Uh, and for DFT relaxation, 32 atoms subsample were extracted from the simulation supercell. Here you can see the specific heat capacity plot. And as we can observe, uh, there are two phase transition. First is high temperature phase transition around uh, 1000 Kelvin and second is the low temperature phase transition around 2000 Kelvin. Uh, the low temperature phase transition corresponds to the formation of uh, two fully ordered phases that can be approximated as chromium cobalt 2 and chromium nickel 2. Uh, well, not actually approximated, but cold. Uh, and uh, uh, 
high temperature phase transition corresponds to the formation of ideally random structure. Here you can see the sample at 1,900 kelvins. The short range ordered structure was absorbed at temperatures below be, between this two phase transition. Here you can see the sample at 510 kelvins. And according to the distribution of Warren Coley short range order parameter among the temperatures of the whole simulation domain, you can see that the short range order is mainly driven by chromium cobalt and chromium nickel pairs as their values are negative within these moderate temperatures. Uh, next, the energy difference between the solid solution ordered structure was analyzed and compared with, the, with the literature, and you can see substantial energy reduction in our case. If you look at the short range ordered structure obtained in the literature, you can see that chromium uh, atom actually bonds with uh, four uh, chromium nearest neighbors, while in this case, the Chromium atom bonds only with one chromium, only with two chromium nearest neighbors, which probably uh, should correspond to the fact that some relief of magnetic frustration in a structure obtained in this work exists, and since and the relief of magnetic frustration should lead to the energy reduction. Next, the contribution of magnetism was analyzed. In order to do so, a separate simulation was performed and this time the low rank potential was trained on non-magnetic density functional theory calculations. Here you can see that a bit uh, a slight change in the phase transition was observed but after the structures uh, was after the short range ordered structures was analyzed it was observed that they have completely the same uh, short range order which probably means that magnetism adapts to the ordering behavior rather than drives it. <clears throat> Uh, so in this work, a uh, new lower energy short range ordering structure was found uh, and it was observed that short range order is mainly driven by chromium, nick and chromium cobalt pairs and energy reduction probably should be driven by the reduction of chromium, chromium nearest neighbor pairs and as a result, the relief of magnetic prostation. Uh, <clears throat> and also it was observed that magnetism actually adapts to the chemical ordering and not vice versa. So in my work, I showed how on lattice modeling approach can be applied to the design of multi-component alloys, and I showed it advantages in modeling uh, these materials. First, in the case on lattice CSP, I showed that only a limited amount of density functional theory calculations are required uh, to obtain new stable structures, even with a relatively uh, large number of items in the unit cells and up to four components. But what's more important, for the first time it was shown that uh, the discovery of crystal structure is also possible using a generative approach when we grow in the structure item by item, as it was shown in all that CSP. Considering the second approach, it was shown that it's also possible to apply it to ceramic materials and by validating the theoretical results with the experimental findings, it was shown that this approach also has a, a good practical, a high practical importance. And finally, this approach also performed the current methods in the designing of a short range ordered materials. Uh, and in all of these simulations, several hundred DFT calculations were required to obtain the results, which is a sufficient improvement in computational efficiency of the current methods. And yes, it's, it provides a prospect for high throughput materials design. Uh, so here are the publications that were uh, done during my PhD. All of them were published in a high reputable journal, some in Q1 and Q2 quartile. In the end, I would like to thank, first of all, my Alexander, my <laughs> supervisor, Alexander Shapeyev, for guiding me throughout the work. Of course, I would like to thank my teammates for helping me at the beginning of my PhD. I would like to thank PhD jury and committee members for uh, giving me uh, for giving me helpful comments as, uh, and suggestions. And finally, big thanks to Skoltek. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for a really impressive work and a great presentation. Uh, well, you already know my opinion.
Uh, now we can hear the opinions and perhaps questions. Well, first of all, questions from the jury members. Um, Professor Levchenko. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I, I think it's a great work. Uh, I like it very much. Um, I have a few questions uh, first about uh, the thesis. Um, so you said that you can control the number of parameters by choosing the rank of the tensor train. Yes. Uh, but how do you choose actually this rank? Uh, well, it's common intuition that you choose something uh, in between the lower and higher rank in order uh, to have a potential with a good accuracy, but uh, without the expense of computational uh, resources. So I choose the rank tr three because, uh, as it was shown in all the previous work, it's enough to get uh, good results mm -hmm. more than with LLP. But uh, what about... Uh, um improving the prediction uh, abilities of your model. Uh, did you uh, try to test some uh, validation, do some validation like cross validation or something? Uh, usually uh, how I analyzed the precision of the train LRP, I calculated the Runme square error and analyzed the convergence. Uh, I didn't do cross validation set. Uh, mm -hmm. for studying the precision of potential I want to analyze the convergence because you can fit very well right but your mm -hmm. prediction for the new uh, structures may be not so good uh, yes I know the yeah. issues like overfitting or underfitting and yeah. so on okay so you didn't uh, no I didn't it. usually I stayed happy with the results if uh, they are first of all confirmed by DFT and secondly confirmed by experiment as mm -hmm. was shown in the second work mm -hmm. so you uh, compared prediction directly to experiment mm -hmm. and DFT. Okay. Yes. I see. Okay. And the second question I had uh, was about uh, so when you when you obtain like uh, conditions at which uh, uh, solid solution is formed, like temperature, uh, did you take into account uh, some of these temperatures are very high? Did you take into account uh, a latest expansion? at this temperature? Uh, no. Uh, as I suppose, you mean that the lattice expansions should be taken into account uh, explicitly in the model itself. Uh, no, it was not uh, done. Uh... <coughs> <coughs> Mostly because uh, it's just a chemical intuition that for high entropy alloys, when you have uh, uh, quite high degree of lattice distortions, uh, usually it's expected to have a, a high lattice expansion, like at extremely high temperatures, I guess more than 2000 kelvins that were observed in experiment and in the theoretical modeling. So you wouldn't expect uh, a large effect on your... I wouldn't expect uh, a large effect, and I would like also to note that I wouldn't expect it in case of heavy elements in the alloy. In case of lighter elements like aluminum, probably it would be good to take into account lattice expansion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, the last uh, related uh, question, uh, when you showed the comparison with uh, uh, between theory and experiment for latest constant, mm -hmm. you showed one number, it was perfect. Uh, like, can four, four I, I ask you to uh, turn on the presentation? Ah, uh, so, no, I go. Yes, okay. uh, yeah. So, experiment and theory. Mm -hmm. It's almost perfect, uh, but this is uh, experiment is done at which temperature? Uh, okay, so experiment uh, is done at, uh, okay, so we had sample and then different regions of the chamber in which sample was synthesized, we had different temperatures because we have temperature gradient. So uh, when I'm talking about the solid solution phase, it was the area of the chamber where we had the corresponding temperature, 2000 Kelvin. 
And when I'm talking about the, the decomposed sample, I'm talking about the area of the chamber where the temperature was below the phase transition temperature. After that, the sample was cooled down to the room temperature. And it was only after that when the XRD was performed and the lattice parameter was measured. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was cooled down. Mm -hmm. and, okay, okay. Uh, thank you uh, for your answers. Uh, Thanks. I, I do not have more questions. Do we have any questions from online members of the jury? Professor Blatov, perhaps? Yes, um, <clears throat> I have some questions uh, concerning uh, thesis and uh, uh, some questions uh, concerning uh, uh, the report. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, thank you, Vadim, for uh, great work and uh, uh, for this report presentation, very clear. Uh, and uh, I, what is important for me also as a practical crystal chemist uh, is very useful also uh, for practical applications uh, because uh, really <clears throat> these uh, high entropy alloys uh, is a challenge uh, for crystal chemistry too. Uh, I, concerning uh, thesis, uh, I have uh, still some questions after answers uh, to my uh, uh, jury report, uh, jury member report. Um, first of all, it concerns uh, experimental verification of uh, the results. Uh, and uh, I had questions um, about uh, uh, experimental data on uh, some um, metallic systems, uh, for example, in niobium molybdenum tantalum tungsten systems. System, uh, there are some uh, binary systems uh, which were also explored, and uh, you found uh, some new phases uh, here compared to a flow database. But my question is, uh, uh, did you check? Uh, uh, the experimental data on these systems. Uh, for, uh, I didn't check all of them, but for example, for uh, niobium tungsten system, binary system, I didn't find uh, uh, any, uh, uh, any, let's say, intermetallic structures, just uh, alloys, uh, experimentally determined alloys. Uh, but you uh, discovered some uh, new intermetallic compounds. So my question is, uh, uh, how uh, can you uh, uh, comment uh, uh, this uh, relation to experimental data? Did you check all of them, all available experimental data, or you just check uh, uh, theoretical data in a flow system? Uh, thank you for your question. First of all, no, I haven't checked the experimental data of niobium tungsten phase diagram. I checked only with the theoretical flow, which contains zero Kelvin ordered structure. And if there are discrepancies between what a flow and I have predicted with the uh, experimental phase diagram, then it probably means that the ordered phases in niobium tungsten alloy can be observed at very low temperatures or even at uh, zero Kelvin or ground state as DFT does. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably the phase diagram, which uh, diagrams which you are talking about are temperature dependent phase diagrams. And if they contain uh, uh, solid solutions instead of intermetallics, it probably says that uh, temperature and entropy plays here uh, temperature and entropy plays here and uh, uh, the ordering breaks at high temperature. Perhaps it's a general issue concerning theoretical uh, investigations uh, of uh, such systems because uh, again, you could uh, support your work uh, even better if you find some relations to, exper to experiment. Uh, it does mm -hmm. not concern only this uh, binary system, but probably in some other systems, uh, binary systems from this uh, ternary system, uh, quaternary sorry, system uh, could be found uh, in, in, in experiment and probably you will find them in, a, in the experimental databases. Uh, it would be anyway uh, uh, useful, I think. Yes, of course, it's uh, important. Uh, next question concerns uh, uh, 
probably this is some uh, uh, different uh, uh, use of uh, terminology, but uh, as I wrote also in my comments, uh, uh, you talk uh, that in BCC lattice, uh, uh, you have a neighborhood of a given atom uh, with uh, uh, nine atoms and for FCC, uh, uh, 13 atoms. But in general, the neighborhood uh, consists, uh, as probably you said also in your report, uh, consists of the atoms which are most, which are closest to a given atom in the structure. And this means that for BCC, we have eight atoms and for FCC, we have 12, not uh, 13. Uh, but uh, uh, my main question here is uh, uh, about BCC uh, structure, because we can take into account eight atoms, but can also take uh, the next uh, uh, coordination shell, uh, uh, six more atoms. And it could influence uh, the results of the calculation because you will have different uh, uh, different uh, uh, clusters here, and uh, uh, you you can have different results uh, with modeling. Why did you uh, consider only eight atoms uh, for the neighborhood uh, in the BCC structure, not uh, uh, fourteen? Uh, okay, actually, I guess I missed it in the physics. I remember that question. And uh, I remember that I answered it, but actually I considered uh, uh, 14 atoms in the neighborhood. Probably ah. it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So that's uh, perfect. And concerning your report, just uh, two minor questions. Uh, 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 in some cases, you use uh, used uh, uh, energy cutoff. Uh, five uh, milli electron volt per atom in some cases uh, one milli electron volt per, per atom uh, and the question is uh, how this cutoff influences the results because i understand that you uh, wanted to uh, decrease the number of uh, candidates but uh, if we consider uh, or probably you try to do this uh, if uh, you consider higher level uh, then for example five milli electron volts uh, what will be the results? Uh, will we, will they be different or not? Uh, how uh, of influences? Okay, well, yes, it's uh, actually first of all the influence of cutoff will depend on the precision of, of on the accuracy of the trained LRP or cluster expansion model. Because during uh, my work with this algorithm, what I observed that the algorithm can, or that cluster expansion can predict with sub 10 MeV uh, per atom error for structures with nearly the same composition, but for structures with, comp with completely different composition under composition, I mean the stoichiometry, I mean the same uh, atomic types, but different stoichiometry, it can uh, give uh, higher errors. So in this sense, uh, unfortunately, I didn't apply some techniques uh, to make a representative data set for training, cluster expansion, and LRP. But answering your question straightforwardly, in case of potentials that I have now, if I would increase uh, the cutoff, I might, uh, I think, with the same probability, choose structures that can be lying on the convex hull or even lower or with the same probability to the structures that will be high in energy, just because the potentials were not generalized good for structures with different concentrations. Okay, and for perhaps the last question, uh, when applying uh, canonic Monte Carlo uh, simulations, uh, you said that uh, you checked for heat capacity anomalies. Uh, what are the anomalies in this case? Uh, how did you check? Uh, okay, can I ask for showing the presentation? Okay. <clears throat> I don't remember. Okay. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, uh, Professor Blatov, do you see the slide? Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, here you can see the phase transition and uh, 
here you can see how I calculated the specific heat capacity for the case when I account only for configurational entropy. So the sigma squared is the energy variance calculated over a number of Monte Carlo steps. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, if we have high energy variance, it means that uh, Monte Carlo predicts structures with completely different uh chemical ordering because if we have completely different chemical ordering uh between our structures we'll have completely different energies and the energy variance uh will be different and this anomalies results uh uh i would be better to include this in the presentation but i'll try to explain so it will be i don't know like shark peaks uh, going one after another mm -hmm. so for example uh, there will uh, one peak can occur at temperatures 1000, then another peak can occur at temperatures 1010, another peak at temperatures 1030, and I see that potentials general potential generalize bad here because uh, the data on which it tries to predict the energy is completely different. And the data, I mean the chemical ordering of the structures. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is how I describe the anomalies. So you I, detected these anomalies uh, visually. Let's visually, say. yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have no more questions. Um, okay, uh, Doctor Hodap, perhaps you have questions. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, uh, congrats, Vadim. Thanks. Uh, Nice to see you in this position. Nice to see you again, too. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I cannot be uh, in person celebrating <laughs> uh, joining you for Axiom Pub later. Um, well, anyway, I really like your thesis. It's not too detailed, very convenient to read. Um, um, I also checked your comments on my um, questions. I think I don't have anything in particular there. And, I think you clarified most of the things, um, but I have a couple of new questions that um, uh, I thought of during your presentation. So first of all, uh, one question to your um, crystal structure prediction algorithm. Um, so the way how I understand is that you're like determining a new position is by using local energies, right? So then it seems to depend on how you actually train your your lower end potential no uh can, can you, you explain how you train can you please explain how you train your your potential uh can you uh, please first repeat the question so i uh, uh yes yes sure so you train your you you construct these um new you 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 do this crystals growth by like judging on on the lowest energy state right yes and you do this by taking um the energies of your of your lrp right you sum up the per atom contributions yes yes so don't you run in the in a problem of non-uniqueness there like if you account if you make this um non what based don't you run in the problem of non-uniqueness there if you make this decision based on local energies or how do you compute these um how do you train this L let's start like that how do you train the lrp so the lrp is trained uh, on the structures that are sampled from the predictions of the algorithm first of all well at first i start with the uh, uh, so you train it on clusters or do you only do train it on periodic structures? Uh, no, they they are trained on periodic structures, not on clusters, not on neighborhoods. They are trained okay. on periodic structures. And but in your crystal growth, you have you have clusters effectively, right? Yeah, I have clusters, and this is actually the reason why I introduced this alchemical interaction in order to prevent uh, uh, the how to say in order to prevent the effect of non-completeness of these uh, clusters in order to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, the fact that they are not periodic when they are growing. That's why I use an alchemical potential. I seem to ah, ah, okay. so uh -huh. on, on the surface. Okay, so this, so this alchemical potential effectively creates a periodic um, structure. Uh, well, yeah. kind of. 
kind you actually the alchemical potential actually okay, not periodic but it kind of uh mimic the bu- mimic the bulk structure that so we assume that uh, we're growing not like in an empty space but within a bulk so you also have uh, some interaction coming from those uh, empty sites on the surface items ah okay okay thank you yeah and then i have another short question on your comments on mechanical properties. Um, so could you, can you like give like an, an estimate in which situations on which alloys you would expect that um, like, for example, short range order has an effect on specific mechanical properties? Because so my, so my experience, like in a lot of cases, it's just, it, it's, um, it suffices to take like, um, even at low temperatures to take uh, random solid solutions, compute the mechanical properties, and you more or less get the get the right trends uh, for strength, for example. Uh, at, at least for refractory alloys, for FCC uh, high entropy alloys, I do not know actually. But like, can you give like an can you give me an idea on um, like what kind of properties are strongly affected by short range order? Well, I guess the uh, strength toward the shear stress, uh, the material can be more resistible to the shear stress because, uh, uh, no, 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 actually, no. I think that- uh, I mean, any, any mechanical property you can think of, like- I, I don't know, like tensile strength, mm-hmm. for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess when we have a uh, short range order, uh, then probably it might make it easier for dislocations to move because short range order is uh, some an ordered pattern. We don't have a disordered pattern that prevents uh, the dislocation movement due to lattice distortions. We have a less distorted lattice in the area of a short range order. So probably this can decrease the tensile strength, mm-hmm. the shear strength. It's my first suggestion. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you don't have like any like experience from- No, I didn't specifically yeah, check yeah, this. Okay. Okay, yeah, no problem. I was just curious. I don't know it myself, so thanks. Um, and another short question um, about the computational cost. So how, how big are these DFT cells that you're using uh, you for training these potentials? Uh, can you repeat? Okay, how, how big are the DFT cells? Uh, how many atoms are in, this, in the cells? Uh, during, in DFT calculations? Yes. So for what is what is molybdenum, niobium, tantalum, tungsten? Uh, you mean uh, which cells I uh, selected for the training, or? Yeah, I mean in in, in general. I, I, I'm I'm just curious. Um, ah, okay, okay. The 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 the, uh, the I studied the size of the supercells that were predicted by the algorithm. Some of them has 140 atoms in the unit mm-hmm. cell. I also calculated them with DFT. Unfortunately, they were not lying on the convex hull, so mm-hmm. it's not a relatable uh, result, unfortunately. But uh, up to 200 atoms, the algorithm can predict. Okay, cool. And you said like 100, 100 DFT calculations were necessary to, to produce this. Uh, yes, you. As you have seen from the presentation, I always uh, notify. I always mm. uh, told about the final size of the training set, and with this training, only with this training set, the results were produced. Mm. I mean, uh, so how the algorithm works? You start with the initial training set where you have, let's say, only niobium tungsten and their equimolar mixture. Yes, mm. you train the potential run on lattice CSP, predict some structures, uh, uh, select them, uh, relax them with DFT, uh, and then you plot the DFT convex hull. And probably, luckily, you might find something still. Mm-hmm. So when I was doing this loop over, over again, I-
doing this loop over and over again until I ended up with what I shown you on this uh, convex hull picture. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing so, I was selected structure and finally I got 147 structures in the training set. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can say that, okay, I calculated 147 structures that were predicted by the algorithm and among them, I found some stable structures that I built on the convex hull. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, you can say, okay, that the algorithm uh, had to uh, select 147 structures to discover some new structures, some new stable compositions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, sounds cool. So you can almost run it on a laptop. That sounds quite... I quite mean, yes, you can run algorithm on a laptop, but not the DFT, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, if it's just a like a hundred then uh, if you have a good laptop uh, okay one. that's that's it and yes. finally professor hart any questions yeah um i had a lot of similar questions to to max but i wonder um i still have uh still have kind of one question with res with regards to the algorithm for generating structures could could we go to slide 14 in the presentation yeah maybe even maybe it's slide 15 instead maybe I'm trying to remember the picture. Yeah, okay. So here's my question. I think I understand uh, the, the fundamentals of this algorithm. My question is, um, it, it, I, I, I don't understand why the algorithm doesn't generate really, um, really large supercells. How, how do you keep it from what's the stopping criterion what limits the size in the in the final periodic structure that it selects to be tested it uh, looks like it could just go on forever okay yes i can actually discover it forever but uh, the only thing that limits uh, the discovery process is the uh, just say it so it's the uh, condition of an identical neighborhood because uh, once they discovered for the first time algori algorithm starts uh, growing the structures in whole directions and it restricts the growth area which eventually uh, lead us faster to the final periodic structure of course for example I can uh, at first discover two identical neighborhoods but not be happy with it continue to discover another one uh, look if it led to a lower energy and eventually it might uh, go it might might eventually lead to the structure with a larger unit cell just because uh, I was uh, searching for identical neighborhoods for a longer time and the uh, and the next time the vector was built it was large just because I ordered a large number of atoms yeah so is this a, some sort of a parameter that you can control or how does this work during the algorithm? Uh, to, actually, to... no, it's not a parameter. For now, it's a strict restriction that once we find two identical neighborhoods, we immediately stop uh, the growth in uh, the initial area. We just reshape. But if you, if you see two identical um, neighborhoods, that only gives you one lattice vector, right? Don't you need three lattice vectors to like define a, a unit cell? Yes, and after I found the first lattice vector, then I reshaped the growth area. Just imagine that your growth area is just in every direction. Then you reshape it. With, okay. Then you add atoms within this area. And then... Okay. You, uh, let's go next slide. Мне переключить надо на 16 слайд. And then, uh, do you see uh, where I wrote the constructing second unit cell vector? So yeah. uh, I constructed it within uh, after I was adding atoms within the new growth area. Okay. 
Uh, and then the same for the third. I just uh, made the two dimensional uh, the two dimensional images, but imagine that now we are ordering atoms in the direction towards us. And then in this, in this direction, we discover the third lattice vector. And okay. in order to uh, not discover the two dimensional structures, I always uh, calculate the uh, the determinant of the unit cell matrix once I okay. find a new vector. Okay. All right. Great. Um, that, that's, uh, that, well, okay. Another question. Could we go to slide 21? So in this, in this loop at the lower right, you have this on lattice CSP loop. Mm -hmm. So typically what's your you, you know you're doing this um you're generating these trainer training structures by doing your crystal growth algorithm what are typical unit cell sizes that get fed back into the dft uh i selected up to 16 unit 16 item uh, 16 items in in the unit cell in order just not to make my dft calculations computationally expensive okay so in a, in a typical in a typical training set when you get all done you have say you know 100 or 200 training structures what what's what's the average what's a typical size is it is it that limit of 16 or is there a lot of them that are much smaller uh, as I started, not less than four, and I checked that for for component there will be not less than four. But usually it's between four and sixteen. The average size is around ten. Okay. Okay. And the uh, the diversity of the unit cell in terms of uh, the cell shape size uh, and. Um, uh, aspect ratio, can you comment on that? Uh, no, I haven't studied the uh, differences of the unit cell shapes and sizes, but uh, okay. uh, to, uh, from what I uh, looked at, the algorithm rarely predicted structures uh, with almost the same unit cell shapes and sizes usually discover structures with different uh, unit cell angles and uh, vector lengths. Okay. And may maybe this is too technical of a question, but um, when you, when you, when the CSP algorithm uh, suggests a structure for DFT, um, do you do any kind of, um, of any kind of adjusting of that before it goes into DFT, like if it if it predicts something that's super long and skinny, do you do like a Minkowski reduction or something before you feed it back into the DFT? Uh, uh, no, I didn't specifically adjust any parameters for uh, a certain structures before the DFT. Uh, what do you mean about reduction? Like. Uh, if, well, sometimes sometimes algorithms will predict a, a unit cell, which is say long and skinny, but but you can just adjust the 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 basis choice so that you can find something that's equivalent, but is a much more compact unit okay. cell. So so I kind of can uh, choose a primitive cell uh, within this unit cell, right? You're talking about this. But, well, I wasn't thinking about primitive versus um super periodic but i was just thinking you know sometimes you, you you know an algorithm might predict a really skew unit cell but just by adjusting the basis choice you can find something that's crystallographically equivalent ah, but which yeah. is much yeah, more okay compact. finally i understood yes we have uh, uh the in our algorithm we have the function that uh, reduce uh, the uh, configure so it tries to find the equivalent, uh, the smallest equivalent configuration. Okay, yeah, that's what I mean by a Minkowski reduction that th an algorithm to find the shortest basis vectors. Okay, great, thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. 
Um, thank you very much. I also, if you don't mind, have a few questions. Sure. Mm, do I understand correctly that uh, for your cases, the number of configurations was about 100 for training? Yes. I got it correctly, yes. And uh, how many variables uh, did you fit with these configurations? Uh, okay, so in the case of cluster expansion, okay, I should go through the whole presentation because <laughs> I need to count. Okay, so we have niobium tungsten and I use uh, two, ty two cluster types, then it would be uh, first two into power of two plus two into power of two plus uh, uh, two into power of three in case of niobium tungsten. Then mm. in case of molybdenum tantalum. So it's 16 if I am not mistaken. Yes, yes. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, yes. All I wanted to make sure is that the amount of data is much greater than the number of uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. And your structures uh, which you generated for the training set, were they relaxed? Yes. So you move the atoms, but you kept the lattice parameter fixed. Did I hear correctly or not? No, it's the you full relaxation, everything. including mm -hmm. okay. uh, the move of ions, the cell shape sizes also. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful. I noticed that the um, error of this model is about 10 milli electron volts per atom, slightly less, slightly less, like 8.3 on this slide. Uh, which is comparable to MLIP, for, comparable to the full uh, potential with all the possible positions of the atoms. Is this really satisfactory? Here you caught me actually, because this is the error on the training set, not the validation set. Because for uh, on Lattice ESP, uh, I didn't make my decision on whether I should end the simulation on uh, the value of uh, the error on the validation set. Instead, I checked whether the mm -hmm. on lattice CSP st stops predicting the structure. So I analyze how convex half changes. But uh, okay, I think it is satisfactory uh, if answering your question because uh, if we can see the some unit cell. And I guess the uh, if we take two structures, uh, and in, if we take one structure, calculate its energy, then let's say we interchange uh, two atoms between each other, so make a complete different structure and calculate its energy. I uh, assume that the energy difference would be higher than even MeV. So mm -hmm. yes, yeah, I think you're right. <clears throat> uh, then I have a question about configurational entropy. Can you calculate the configurational entropy? Uh, you do Monte Carlo simulations and have you tried to extract configurational entropy from it? Well, configurational entropy. Uh, uh, yes, I think I can calculate because it will be the derivative of uh, energy with the respect of the number of configurations that we have, no? Mm, no, I think it will be different. Um, I think you cannot get it this way. You can get it by integrating heat capacity, mm -hmm. CP over T, DT, integrate this over temperature. You can uh -huh. also get it as derivative of the free energy, but then you have to calculate the free energy and that's rather problematic that's possible but problematic mm -hmm. you can also get it from the partition function but getting partition function is also not that easy but possible or you can get it um, from thermodynamic integration you get free energy and then differentiate so different approaches can be done um, uh, what i'm driving at what i'm driving at you used a very interesting actually criterion for stability of solid solutions for disordering the mm -hmm. peak in the heat capacity. Mm -hmm. So you say when you have a peak in the heat capacity, that's when you have the order disorder transition for a given composition, I must say. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
but still something I feel is perhaps missing. Will the solid solution be stable against decomposition or not? Uh, to determine this, you need the free energy as a function of composition. And then you construct basically a convex hull, common tangent line. Yes. But for that, you would need free energy, which would include the configurational entropy. So I need uh, configurational entropy, but I can obtain configurational entropy from free energy, but at the same time, I... In fact, uh, configurational entropy is part of the free energy. You don't need configurational entropy itself. You need free energy, which includes configurational effects. So somehow from your Monte Carlo calculations, it would be great to have free energy for different compositions. Mm -hmm. And then you can see if the solid solution is stable. Mm -hmm. If it, as long as it forms the convex hull, then it's okay. When you have this uh, thing above the convex hull, then it's not stable. We can discuss it later if you want, but I think this work could be extended in this direction and it would probably gain some yes, actually, extra I, meaning. I thought about it yesterday in the night before. The, <laughs> uh, Defense, how can I extend the, the convex hull to finite temperatures? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, in any textbook of physical chemistry, they show this picture, but they don't say it's convex hull, but it is. Well, so it's, it's already done by Maxwell 170, whatever, 160 years ago. Just not everyone calls it convex hull. Well, a lot of people actually don't know that convex hull is a derivative of a free energy <laughs> with respect to the number of components. Yeah. Um, okay. And my final question is the following. Uh, all of the phases that you study are actually metals. Right. Metals have one side effect, electronic entropy. And if you want to have a model which is um, transferable to different temperatures, you have to somehow take configuration or uh, electronic entropy into account. What do you do to that end? Do you just throw it away or you have something that tells you that uh, electronic entropy will change with temperature like this and this and that? Mm, I think better to have this, not to throw it away. Uh, you're asking me how can I calculate the electronic entropy? Electronic entropy is calculated by any DFT code. Mm -hmm. And for each configuration, it will be slightly different. And it will make a contribution to the free energy uh, where you will have to take the ensemble average of configuration mm -hmm. entropies of all different uh, states, or different configurations. Uh, but then it will also depend on temperature. Yes. Expect that I expect that it should grow with the temperature. Of course. Yes. Um, so if you don't take that into account, there will be a piece missing in the free energy and, and also missing in the in the, the heat capacity model. plot as well. I expect that if we include in the, the heat vibrational capacity. and electronic entropy, the heat capacity or the phase transition peak should appear earlier mm -hmm. and especially for materials with lighter elements mm -hmm. did you take that into account i'm not uh, sure how not important here. it is no no no, mm -hmm. no not here uh, not here because uh, uh i have this uh, thought in the back of my mind that the next step of this work would be accounting for vibrational and electronic entropy we actually were discussing like a few months ago that this would be <laughs> our next idea but not mm -hmm. for now. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. These are all the questions that I had. Uh, okay. Um, any questions from the audience um, here in the room or online? No questions? Actually, online, I can see only the jury members. Okay. So maybe if we have questions from audience so here, the you are most people welcome. In attendance here in the room, any questions? Okay. In that case, <coughs> we are ready for the 
word of the supervisor. Professor Shapir. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for the jury members, uh, some of whom woke up very early today to drive to the office. Uh, <laughs> but to, to all of them um, uh, for finding time and um, to find it possible to participate here. Um, you asked many good questions, uh, to many of which I myself don't know the answer, but I know all the answers to Artyom Oganov's questions. So actually, we, we can talk later about those. Um, now, about Vadim, um, so he was uh, doing his PhD for four years. And in the very beginning, when he came, I gave him this project of generative algorithm for crystal structure prediction. I thought that would be uh, something very interesting. And it appeared to be a very hard problem. So what Artem is doing, Artem Oganov, I mean, is a yeah, very hard problem. So along the way, we have to make many compromises, some of which were spotted with the uh, jury members' questions. But in the end, uh, we just published the paper a few months ago. So, um, yeah, so Vadim has actually had a very um, persistent character that was pushing this problem for years. And along the way, we solved some simpler problems with Monte Carlo, just to have enough papers for his CV and to meet the uh, defense requirements. But yeah, the really challenging problem was the crystal structure prediction, which uh, to me was simply the uh, just a test bed for some real like off lattice, which which would be much more complicated. So Vadim showed excellent um, excellent qualities. Um, I'm very happy with his work. I'm very happy with him personally. I'm happy that he's staying at least for a while to work with me. Interestingly, Vadim is now interested in biology. I know Gus is interested in biology, and I myself is interested in biology. So. <laughs> Uh, to some extent, at least. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm very happy with Vadim's work, too. So um, I hope he will be granted his uh, title of PhD. Thanks. Uh, OK. Um, if there are no further questions, then the defendant and his supervisor should leave the room. <laughs> Oh, there is a question. Okay. Yes. Better late than never. Okay. <coughs> Can you hear me? Sasha Twidvenik. Can you hear me? Yes. So that's a bit perhaps uh, outside perhaps the very norm of this project. I don't know if it's already a, uh, answered or discussed, but I, I'm, I'm always wondering whether you used any any opti whether you looked into the optimization of the entropy, like finding maximum minima, whether it is, whether there's any any utility for this for your projects, uh, if you could spare some comments. And also, I mean, I'm talking about the maximization, say, of the entropy. That uh, was one of the last questions before uh, this one. Uh, did you look into the optimization of your entropy of your system's entropy? Uh, you mean optimize the entropy with respect to the composition or? Yes, for example, yes. Uh, no. Do you see any potential for this? To look into the optimization of this? No. For this project? Okay, mm -hmm. I was... No. And what partition functions did you use? You mean in Monte Carlo? Yeah, or... yeah. Do you, do you also use any uh, partition, partition functions for the ensemble? <laughs> As an example, in, in so looking at it in a collective way, I mean, which you pro, you surely did, I guess. Uh, I know these questions are more generic, but they also have some both mathematical and most likely uh, physical. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I know because I didn't look at uh, Monte Carlo from the mathematical point of view, so. Uh, I didn't specifically. Uh, I didn't specifically uh, pay attention to the partition function. Uh, have you thought of the possibility of using path integrals 
to calculate. Uh, for example, uh, I heard before that you could calculate the entropy by integrating, not actually differentiating uh, the energy function, right? Uh, no, but because uh, the final goal was not to optimize the entropy, uh, e, I mean, like to obtain the composition in order to yeah. optimize the entropy. Because in this case, the Monte Carlo work would to uh, to obtain the uh, optimal composition for the highest entropy. It means that I would need to. Uh, change the compositional constitution of elements, like not the equimolar alloy, but change the composition of certain chemical elements. It should be done in a grand canonical ensemble, not canonical ensemble. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I don't know if you mentioned anything about it, but uh, what perturbation uh, theory tools do you use when you did your simulations, if any? Do you use mm -hmm. any perturbation? No, 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 no. That's just Poincaré instead, because when you increase the entropy, you the order of the system also. Uh, not any perturbations. Uh, the, uh, not any perturbation theory in specific. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Thanks for your answers. That's what all my say. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, other questions. Mm -hmm. If no questions, then uh, Vadim and his supervisor should for a brief while leave the uh, end of the audience too, and the audience too, and the jury will deliberate about this work. The jury has the pleasure to announce that Vadim Satskov has been granted the degree of a PhD unanimously without any corrections to the thesis, which is the highest distinction. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. That's the only part of the speech I didn't re rehearse, so I don't know what to say, but first of all, I feel extremely grateful to everyone in this room and everyone in the Zoom chat, to Max, Vladislav Blatov, Gus Hart, Artyom Aganov, Sergey Levchenko, Alexander Shapiev, my group mates. Uh, only Ivan is here. So, Ivan, thank you a lot for being throughout of my presentation. It was great for years at Skoltech. Actually, uh, okay, I should make a confession because rather for, for, for years, I don't know how it's called in English, but in Russian, it's called syndrome Smazvanza. So, yeah, for four years I felt the syndrome that I'm not that clever enough <laughs> to be here and to make a PhD. But yes, nevertheless, it happened. So thanks a lot for being with me and helping me throughout this great four years. Thank you. <laughs>